Welcome friends. Today I'm going to do 21 questions ahead of Cozy, the costume symposium that's happening later this summer. And it's just a little bit of a way for you to get to know me and my sewing and my projects and all the fun things. So let's go. So what is Cozy? Cozy is costume symposium and it's going to take place from August 19th to the 22nd this summer. And it's going to be all online, all on YouTube and there's also some other things that are going to be happening tangentially on Instagram. Like I know last time they're really cool badge opportunities and everything. So anyway, it's a, it's a whole virtual convention and I hope you'll join us for that because it's supposed to be a really fun community event and like if you're an aspiring costumer or even costumer, this is the perfect event for you. If you want updates and you want to know what programming is going to be like, definitely follow Costume Symposium on Instagram because that's where all the events are going to be. That's where you're going to find links to the Discord, to giveaways, to all the things that people are doing, to the panels, all that cool stuff. So definitely follow there. It's going to feature different folks that you're going to see, different programs you're going to see. And it's just going to be awesome. It's going to be a fun community event. And I really hope that you're there because like the people putting it together are working really hard to make this a really fun event. So again, to prep for this, a lot of us are doing these 21 question kind of videos. So you can get to know us ahead of the event and you can get to know other folks in the community because hopefully you'll be able to find a playlist linked out from here that you can just click through and follow other cool folks in this space and learn about other cool makers, creators, and like awesome engineers because that's really what a lot of folks are doing. I will be answering some questions. I'll be drinking some tea. I'm in my sewing room and because I'm in my sewing room, I'm going to make something. I'm going to be working on a pattern that I've made for this reticule. I'm going to test my own pattern to make sure it works out okay and make a second bag. So I'm going to work on that a little bit today while I'm talking to you. And you can't make a box bottom bag without a box. So that's what we're going to start with. And I'm going to slowly dismantle it. I will be using my paper, cardboard, etc. scissors. What is your favorite genre of costuming? That is a great question. So I actually enjoy mashups the most. What do I mean when I say mashups? So mashups to me are when you mash up two really cool ideas, whether it's like Edgar Allan Poe Dameron, bless Oscar Isaac, or my favorite is when you use historical silhouettes to translate a cosplay or costume and use inspiration from that. So the TLDR is that I really like when people mash up historical stuff with non-historical things. So like I made a mashup Emma Clueless Regency Ensemble. I took the Clueless iconic Cher yellow plaid and I made myself a Regency Ensemble because Clueless is based on Jane Austen's Emma and Jane Austen wrote in Regency era. So I thought what a cool idea would be to mash up these two things, bring them kind of in this different place. I've used pre-visual designs from Star Wars to do different really cool historical Star Wars looks. You can check out my Instagram where I actually have a ton of comparisons based mostly on the costume silhouette from Star Wars to historical silhouette. And it's really cool to track because it's just like clearly these things are inspired by a lot of cultures and places. And there's a lot of people who do a lot of research about how Padme Amidala's costumes, a lot of her queen costumes are inspired by Mongolian culture. A lot of what I did was mostly just looking at the silhouettes she has a lot of very intricate regal things that actually hark into Tudor kind of medieval -y spaces. So it's really cool. It's a really fun thing. I think like I love when people get really excited about the two things and like mash two ideas together. This video is not sponsored by Mountain Dew, but if Mountain Dew needs a nerdy ass costumer, I'm here. What originally got you into costuming? I 100% got into costume and cosplay because of movies, because of films I was watching. Like I loved historical dramas. I loved period, like TV shows, any of those things I was really into. I super love Star Wars. And those are things that really got me excited to make costumes because the costumes that were in those things were really cool and different. And of course, like nothing that I would ever be wearing, right? So I was really inspired by pop culture which is why I will defend it forever because I think that like a lot of people's first exposure to historical costuming and cosplay I mean clearly cosplay especially um is going to be sparked from pop culture and I think when people especially in the historical costuming space um really downplay that and don't really understand that like you know with the surge of new fans we should maybe be welcoming to folks and like even if they aren't 100% historically accurate what can we do to make folks feel welcome where they are in this space? So 
anyway, I'm really inspired um, by that kind of stuff, you know, from watching Jane Austen films when I was young to, you know, Titanic came out when I was a kid and that was major. I still didn't really get Edwardian quite yet. Like, I really think that, like, it took maybe Downton Abbey for me to, like, have that click in my brain of, like, this is what this silhouette is, this is what this look is. And then, like, Pirates of the Caribbean, the Elizabeth Swan purple dress was, like, my dream dress for the longest time and I finally made it during the pandemic. I finally finished that costume. What is your dream event or a photo shoot opportunity? Whew. My dream event is getting to go on my honeymoon because I got married in a pandemic and I haven't gotten to go anywhere, let alone have an actual wedding where my family got to be in. So my dream would be for me and my husband to get to go on our honeymoon and like get to go to Bath and like all these other cool places. Our, our dream is to be able to go to Europe, specifically like the UK, and spend some time going to some filming locations and sites that like are really important to like pop culture things that we love and have shared with each other from like Highlander to Jane Austen. We just want to have a really cool experience um, that's going to be kind of based around movie locations. And of course we're going to take costumes, duh. Next question. Who do you look up to who taught you your crafts? Okay. My great grandma was still alive. She was in her 90s when she passed. She was still alive when I was a kid. And she actually was one of the first one to try to teach me how to sew. Was I good at it? No, because I was like in like the second grade at most when she first started trying to teach me how to sew on like her big built in like sewing machine thing. So I was not very good. But, like, she definitely kept, like, giving me little projects. Like, whether it's just literally sewing two pieces of fabric together just so I'd get stitches to watching her make these massive quilts. And we still have, like, a ton of those quilts from, like, the early 1900s. My great-grandma definitely was, like, really encouraging. Was I good at any of that? No. Did I learn anything? I mean, like, honestly, probably not. Because the sewing machine she was using isn't anything that I have today. And, um, you know, she was just trying to teach me the basics of make a stitch. Um, I'm sure she tried to, but, you know, teach me actual, here's how you sew something, here's how you tailor something. When I was a kid, like, I didn't understand any of that. You know, I barely understood how to do math at that point in my life. So my great grandma was definitely a major part of just instilling that, like, sewing was a thing we do, and it's a thing that, like, you could do if you spend time doing it, but you don't have to. And any time I talk about my costuming sewing background, I would be remiss to not mention the Costumer's Guide to Movie Costumes. The site itself is this like massive repository for a ton of movie archival stuff. And it was all beautiful films that I loved, whether it's historical or Star Wars, or even like at the time Harry Potter, boo, problematic now, I'm not supporting JK Rowling ever. But her site was a big deal for me because that's where I would hang out. Like if I was in the like computer lab after class waiting to get picked up, I would be on her site perusing all of the costumes. If she had a DIY, I would like drool over it and dream about it and just like fantasize about getting to make my own costume one day. And her site is like the reason that I loved costumes because it's all this detail um, about how it's made and like breakdowns and like people would go to like the museum if it was on display somewhere and be like, oh, actually under this lighting, this is how it looks and these are the seams and like you can tell when it's angled this way that it actually had the secret attachment here. Anyway, that site set me up for loving costumes. And I, I really didn't get to make stuff until much later, until after college. But that website and like that community space there just instilled in me this love of like garments and like making things and construction around that. That was beyond anything that I would understand for a very long time. Which of your projects are you the proudest of? Since we're in the nostalgia area, I will definitely say that finishing my purple Pirates of the Caribbean dress is like, honestly, like legit the thing that I'm most proud of. Like I've done things that are 10 times more technical, but the thing about that dress was I started that in high school and I had no idea what I was doing. I didn't have a sewing machine. I didn't really understand construction at all. Like I couldn't even make flat stuff yet, like pillowcases. I hadn't even tried that stuff. I used a modern pattern and I was like, oh, well, like I got a pattern and I was like, okay, well, the thing on here is purple. So that we're, we're off to a good start, right? And so I was like, oh, and it has like these cute little princess seams. So like, that's also cute too, right? So I literally just went for a thing that I thought it looks to my brain close enough. 
and I got this pattern. This very cheap, very just like very starter. Like it's one of those starter patterns you're supposed to use to like hack so that you understand how to slash and do all those things. And <laughs> I cut out pieces for the bodice and it like never really worked right because I didn't really know how to put it together. I wasn't great at it and I just kind of gave up. I didn't keep a lot of stuff from my before college days but somehow I held on to that outfit and during the pandemic I finished it. I only had the fabric I had right like there was no way to match it and I was just like okay it's not gonna be movie accurate but like this was the dream dress I wanted as a teenager and this is literally the dream dress I tried to put together but I didn't know what I was doing. I'm proud of that and like yeah the polonaise isn't massive. There's things that are not working on there but like I had to use what was left of that thing. I'd only cut out the bodice, so I had to rejigger the whole bodice to actually have the right seams. There's just so much piecing going on in some of those pieces. And I'm fine with that because like this is for me. Like this was my dress and like I'm not gonna be looking at my shoulder seam or like in the back when I'm wearing it and being like, oh, that's a piece, I pieced that. I don't care. I made it because I loved it and I challenged myself, I'm not gonna buy more fabric for it. I'm just going to use what I have and I did it. I did buy the fastenings for it and a little bit of gold trim, that was it. I used only stuff I'd had on hand. I just was like, fuck it, I'm gonna finish it. And it was like, I'm so proud of it because I had no room to spare with the fabric that was left and I did it. I can wear it to the beach and I'm not going to be upset if I get it dirty. Are you team cut or team trace? I'm team cut. If I bought the pattern, I'm going to cut that out. I'm going to note on the thing any size differences and I'm just going to own it because like I don't care. It's mine. I'm not going to trace that. I don't have enough space. I live in a small city. Like I can't do that. Next question. What skill would you like to learn? Oh my god. Ah, <sighs> millinery. I would love to learn how to make hats. I'm always hungry for a new skill and a new part of like costuming. I taught myself, I mean, I can't really say I taught myself because I use all the free resources online, but during the pandemic, I learned how to do bobbin lace, lace making. You can see my whole um, video about that somewhere down here or up here. So yeah, I think millinery. Like I love hats. I have so many hats that I don't wear, Shh. but if I could learn how to make hats, no one could stop me. How many pieces are looking in my UFO bin? I'd say there's probably like 12. The way that I organize my UFO bin is I keep um, bags, like nice little Ziploc bags that look, are large for garments. And I use those to organize my UFOs. And <laughs> I've got a lot. Shockingly, um, I've got a lot. One thing with me is like because I do upcycle and recycle stuff, I often will be like, oh, well, like I have this much leftover wool from this thing. Well, I want to make it a vest. So I'm just going to put that and like put that with the pattern pieces and everything, everything's left and then have that put away as my next project and I never get to it. My Edwardian corset is in the shame corner because it's mad at me. We can talk about that later. What is the most unconventional material I have used. I'm not gonna count the Mountain Dew box that I'm using right now because I don't think it's the most unusual. I will say that I think the weirdest thing I've used in a costume that I definitely count as a material because it is part of the vital construction of it and it is my 1830s outfit. 1830s has these big magnificent sleeves and tiny waists and big skirts. Wild hair. So to get the sleeves to stay big, right, because you, you can make big fabric but if it's not stiff enough or you don't have anything under it, it doesn't stay up. So this is why I count this as a material because you do need something under those sleeves to keep them nice and puffed. You can get or, or make plumpers and I um, bought some, but not conventional plumpers, not like a thing that would a costumer made for me. I bought inflatable neck pillows like you wear on a flight. And I basically inflated them so much that like they were pretty, they had some air in them and then I could still wedge them inside the sleeve. And then I blew them up more once I got them inside the sleeve because the little armhole is like as big as my arm. And then when I put it on, I made sure that like my arm went through them. So my plumpers were just inflatable neck pillows. 
and I think that's the best thing I've ever used. I've used the same thing for travel especially. Like I've used them as a split bum roll because it just it travels nicely. It's not a problem. I can wear it on the flight. It's great. Which era or genre would you still like to make a costume of? That's tough. So I definitely would love to eventually make, you know, the French court gown, the robe a la Francaise, but I would really like to deep dive and do something from like where my family's from. So my family, part of my family is from El Salvador. Um, and a, because of war and another war, many wars and colonization, a lot of history and a lot of the information around like historical wear is kind of hard to come by in my my heart of hearts like as much as I'm like yeah I want a silly French court gown I want these things that I can run around in and be silly in I think that my dream dress right now or costume would be do, being able to have the agency and the time the money to do the research and to find the stuff that like my ancestors would have worn and to make some kind of either costume for myself or even something that's just like a thing that's like a useful tool for other folks like a here's even a miniature version of a thing just so it exists in some way biggest sewing crafting pet peeve when i don't finish a project like i know that i am my own problem and that's because i'm a virgo and i make my own problems but I definitely really hate when I don't finish a project because it just, it haunts me and I don't leave enough notes. And I'm trying to get better about leaving myself notes on like where I left off and what's next, but like sometimes I just forget and I hate it. How has the pandemic changed what or how you sew and craft? Well, I quit my job because I hated it um, and it was a terrible toxic space. So um, sewing became like my happy place, my safe space because I work professionally in social media and I work professionally in a news space. And I don't know if you know, but 2020 was a really hard news year on top of a lot of things that were going internally around racism and people not being treated fairly. So having the excuse to not use my phone is really, really good for me because again, I work professionally in this space that we also are on in our leisure time, social media. And it's really hard to have a dividing line there, especially when everything's news, right? Um, so I felt like sewing was a big safe space for me, a happy place. Whereas before the pandemic, it was a thing that like, I'd have to rush for deadlines and everything. And now I would like rush to leave my desk to do it. Okay. Next question. What did you do learn in the past year that you are most proud of? Honestly, I feel like teaching myself how to make bobbin lace is like the thing that I'm most proud of because it's super fun and super cool and it's another thing that keeps me off my phone because I just really need to sometimes I just really need to have my hands fully doing something that's definitely been like a really fun fulfilling thing and like I'm not amazing at it yet but like it's just fun and it's cool do you pick a project and then procure materials or collect materials and let them speak to you both I definitely have gone directly to like my local little fabric place that's close to me and gotten like the closest thing to the pink Emma Spencer material that I could but I've also just gone and been like this is in the dollar bin I'm gonna get 10 yards of this because why not and I feel like for cosplay too um like you're trying to go in for specifics versus also with historical costuming or just I'm slowly getting into like making my own kind of clothes like vintage-y looking things those are things where I'll be like oh well, like what does this fabric kind of look like what could this work for and then I use the patterns I have to be like what does this work with scissors or a rotary blade I would say despite me using scissors right now for cardboard I am rotary blade forever now I got a deeply discounted cutting board and two rotary cutters that came with it a big and a small and I've been sold ever since like I love it I would love one day to get a rotary board that's the size of my table because right now my my rotary cut thing is just like barely bigger than my laptop and that doesn't cut massive pieces for dresses and everything for now this does the job one day i'd love to size up because i love using this and i've definitely cut off the board before many times i need to replace my blades super bad do you have any sewing assistants or pets <sighs> i have a pet it is an english angora rabbit of some kind i think he's an escaped muppet and i will take you on a field trip to see him 
right now. As you can see, that rabbit isn't gonna be helpful. He also doesn't really bug me. My sewing room isn't anywhere near where he is and he refuses to step on hardwood. Unless I'm doing a project on the sofa with him there, he's kind of like, you don't exist to me. Like I'm dead to him unless I have food or pets to offer. So he doesn't really get involved in it other than the couple times where I'm like embroidering on the sofa. Do you have any bad sewing habits? I already talked about how I don't finish all my projects and I just leave some half done. I will say that a bad sewing habit I have is just not cleaning my workspace and the sewing machine, like deep cleaning them every time. And like, I know that my version of clean doesn't fit everyone's version of clean. So what I mean is like, not just having some space to cut, it's like everything is put back. I have swept the floor, maybe even mopped it, and I've hand cleaned my sewing machine. That is what I would want in, I, in an ideal world between every single project that I do. I don't do that, and that's bad, um, but that's bad for me. So uh, definitely don't gauge yourself based on my definitions because I am type A AF. Do you put your pins in parallel to the same line you're sewing or do you pin perpendicular? I would say it really just depends. If it's a long thing of fabric, those are gonna go in parallel, but it's perpendicular if it's like a curve or something small, just because there's not a lot of space to work with. What do you like to watch or listen to while sewing? I love to listen to audiobooks while I'm sewing. And honestly, it's gonna be romance books and the raunchier the better. I want to just get lost in my sewing room and in what I'm making and I don't want to know any terrible stressful thing that is like waiting in my inbox for me. I just want to escape to a nice place where I have control and I can listen to some smut as I'm making something silly. What are your goals or plans moving forward? In terms of goals and plans moving forward. I definitely want to offer way more resources and um, I launched a Patreon this year which is a big deal for me and like I was scared because I've been trying to for years and just like it just never worked out and so this year I finally have done it and I'm excited about it and it's really fun and I appreciate the people so much who are supporting the work there because I'm not only doing like Jane Austen literary stuff a lot of stuff on like being anti-racist in the Jane Austen community space it's also helping me like justify spending hours of my weekend where I could be doing freelance work Instead, I'm writing up blog posts on all these different things, including some DIYs I do and some Regency reticule patterns that I've been making. All I to say, going forward, I just want to keep having fun. I am in these spaces because they're fun for me and I never want it to not be fun. Like once things lose their fun, I start to really question what's going on and why I'm there. And like for me, I've still been able to maintain a, like a space and a community and surround myself with folks that do have fun and want to make it fun for other people. Last question. What fabrics are in an online basket that you would love to buy? That's like a loaded question. So as much as I'm sure a lot of people dream of silk, piles and mountains of silk, I feel like weirdly enough, I would just like a gift card for like 50 bucks to go to like my local fabric store and just be like, fuck it. I'm going to buy $50 of like all of the random things they have like from their dollar bins or even like the mystery box from mood i kind of want to get like their 50 dollars box of like random things because i'm like every time people have gifted me random fabrics i've pushed myself to learn a new garment to make new stuff from it and it's actually really fun and cool so i may not want silk but i 100 want some wools because i definitely want to make some beautiful edwardian wool attire skirts and like you know I want to make some nice vests and things and I'd love 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 to make a wool cape because I just think like that's beautiful it's multi-use it is seasonal for most of the year where I live because it's foggy right now in the middle of May and yeah so I think either a mystery fabric bin or wool speaking of mystery fabrics History Garments sent me a box of amazing goodies, amazing fabrics, and I put them to use already. And I just want you to see what I did with it. So this is inspired by Shadow and Bone, the new Netflix show, and this is inspired by their kafkas that they wear. 
This is inspired by the Sun Summoner, and I handed all of this embroidery over like 30 plus hours. Don't ask me about my hand cramps. But I wanted to make that costume because I thought it was really cool, but I was also like, I don't, I don't want to buy the silk and make this blue silk costume. I want to do something different with what I have. And so I had this solid blue polyester kind of a thing that I'd use for my sabriel. And then History Garments had sent this stuff that was this beautiful blue, and you can see it's, it's a little transparent, but it's textured. And the, the stuff that they have on the show has this beautiful kind of thorny pattern running through it, but it looks a little textured from afar. So I thought I'd just combine the two. So I put the sheer blue on top of the solid blue, and I made this Kafka-inspired dress. It's really a wrap. It has pockets. And those are fun things that I like to do because I'm just like, man, like, what am I going to do? How do I make this thing? And it's just like, what's in my stash? Like, I'm 100% going to go to my stash first if I'm like inspired by a thing, especially during the pandemic. In pre-pandemic times, I would be like, I guess I'll go to the fabric store and get some fabric. But now it's really exciting to be like, what's in my stash? And like letting that speak to me. So I guess that redacts my previous comment, but I'm too lazy to re-record it. And I stand by what I said. Anyway, thanks for joining me and I hope this was fun and helpful for you. I hope that you tune in for Cozy later in August and I hope that you check out the other costumers out there because there's actually a lot of um, BIPOC folks in this space too. I think for me as a Latinx woman, when I first got into historical stuff and literary stuff, I'm always like wondering if I'm the only person of color in the space and it's been really really cool and empowering to see other people of color here and be represented so if I can leave you with any tips um my definite number one thing would be from now on when you are recommending costumers please make sure that you're recommending some costumers of color because there's something to be said for if you're talking to new audiences and different audiences sometimes there's gonna be people of color there and you're gonna make them feel more comfortable if you also make it really clear there are actors people of color in this space. That's just a signal that like a lot of us are going to look for when we're entering or considering entering a new space. So that's like the big tip I will leave you with. Please recommend costumers and recommend costumers of diverse backgrounds. Thanks for joining. I'm going to dehydrate myself. Thank you for watching. If you'd like to become a patron, please check out the link in my description, which has a link to my Patreon. And all of them get access to a special Discord server called the Jane Austen Avocado Toast Club. Thank you. Please like and subscribe.